but wetware is on it, isn't the no. on computer, so <laughs> no, we need, we need access to one. Yeah. <laughs> you can measure it. <laughs> Besides, sometimes sometimes you don't save anything with qubits. Uh, I was trying to, I'm, I'm just making that my piece, no joke. <laughs> Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, this is about learning something from omniscient improvers. Yeah. Are you going to enter that then? Yes, okay. You need two of them actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's only, you know, there's, people there's, there's only me to give this talk. So you, you can't. Oh, right. That's true. You're, you're right. You're right. <laughs> QIP stars for more efficient than like um, IP now, or just QIP? It's easy to get an RE up or down for all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The NIP star agreed. No, I mean, is QIP better than just IP? Oh, um, no, I think it's, I think they're both P space. I don't know for sure. I think, I think they're both P space. <laughs> You're ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome back, everyone, uh, to our January 7th Open Security Seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Grammy Cooper. Okay. Well, thank, thanks so much for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's really pretty groovy here in, in France and in Paris. <laughs> And, uh, and and the invitation is, is, is uh, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to come speak here. Um, so I want to talk about something. You know, the, the real meat of the talk. I'm just going to promise you ahead of time. Really, is combinatorial group theory, but that's that's for later. There's an outer context of this, which is quantum algorithms and what quantum algorithms are for. And I think there has to be this introduction, even though it brings in its own non-trivial material, which I'm going to skim over a little bit. So there's a certain computational problem. Uh, suppose, suppose that you have uh, a group G, and just think of some discrete group, some discrete group that you understand pretty well. Uh, the integer is a free group, and, you know, any, anything familiar. Not, not a, G itself is not considered a difficult group. And then you have an unstructured set X, and uh, then you have what's called a, a hiding function. Um, um, I don't call it a hide, no, hides here, okay? But the F is also called a hiding function. Um, but what does that mean? It means that it's H periodic for, for a subgroup H and otherwise injected, okay? Now, you, you're given an algorithm to compute F, the hiding function, and from the in the interesting cases, the the algorithm to compute f doesn't reveal its periodicity in any immediate way, but you do have access to f, and now you have this computational question: uh, find h given an algorithm for f, or given access to f. I mean, in, in computer programming, this kind of thing is called functional input when you provide a function to another function as input, and now, the, this is a very general problem that depends, as the later slides are going to say, uh, uh, a whole lot on the specific choice of G and also assumptions in H. Okay? But the theme of it is that, that in interesting cases, uh, your, this hidden subgroup problem is, is just completely hopeless for classically, if you wanted a fast algorithm. What, however, we choose things, we choose the group G so that, so that you're dead on the water unless you do one of two things, unless you somehow learn something from the guts of the function f, maybe you could gain, you, you could solve the problem that way by looking, you know, by 
by, by looking inside the box rather than using it. Or if you're not allowed to do that, you need a quantum, you'll need a quantum computer to solve this. Okay. So a good example is the short Kitay of the algorithm. Here, G is certainly by the standards of this seminar. Uh, uh, a tame, uncontrolled virtual group, just three of you in the case, Z to the K. And suppose further, we'll even make an assumption on H that, that the hidden subgroup has maximum rank. Okay. Then there's the discovery, the rather profound discovery of Shore, that we can calculate H and quantum polynomial time, even uniformly in dimension K. And polynomial time in the bit complexity of the AM. So explicitly, H will have some generator matrix. And then miraculously, just by evaluating the, the function F, uh, the, the hiding function F, and doing some, some processing, uh, a quantum computer can figure out the previous. Is there a question? No. Uh, okay. Yeah. You should have the power to turn them off. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so I see the question made in your mind. What means quantum polynomial time? And, uh, it means, well, polynomial time. I'm not sure it's ever been announced. Okay. <laughs> polynomial time means that the, 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 the computer works in something like linear time. Or yeah, that, um, well, it means that the computer must be a quantum computer. Oh, what the quantum computer is? Well, uh, there's three levels of uh, computation, three levels of computational resources that are provisionally, there are three models of computers that are provisionally realistic. The first and traditional thing is a standard deterministic computer. Its dynamic is, is completely deterministic. And then it'll just work and compute its answer in polynomial time. So, for instance, for the Euclidean algorithm that, that runs with no coin flips on, on a standard combinatorial computer. <laughs> so, then the second level is randomized algorithms where the computer is also allowed to flip coins. Okay. And then there's, there's an allowance, it's a randomized algorithm that, that uh, the answer only needs to be probably correct. Probably with very high probability, maybe, but not 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 quite deterministic to occur. Well, uh, a random a computer that's ten foot coins is already something different from a computer that can't, and this showed up in practice. And modern chips come come with an internal coin flipping ability. Now, finally, for a quantum computer, it's it runs algorithms that are like randomized algorithms, but with quantum probability instead. In other words, with the rules of probability that are adapted to quantum mechanics, with Hilbert spaces and qubits instead of bits and so on. And the quantum algorithms are a bit like random algorithms, but they're really random algorithms on steroids. So you can do special things you couldn't do before for special purposes. It's not faster for all purposes, but, but just like random, just like coin flips are a, a resource, quantum superpositions are also a computational resource. But this would really require a new type of uh, computer. Okay. Yeah, that's why you really see the question about, about the thing you decide. What about more classical products? If you take the same problem, you want to recognize your subgroup. If you use randomized algorithm instead of quantum computers, right. then you, you immediately, even for k equals one, which was the most celebrated first case. So, just don't worry about z to the k, just take the integer z. Then you notice you're, it's polynomial time uniformly in the bit complexity. So this means polynomial time in the number of digits of the periodicity if g is, say, z. Okay. Now, that's if, if you only have black box access to f, that's just strictly impossible classically. You must take, you must, you need exponentially many evaluations of F for a classical computer to have any clue of the periodicity. So the time will be exponential. Yeah. You get an exponential lower, lower bound with a black box assumption of that. Unconditionally, or is it in P equals the value one P? Well, the black box assumption is a condition. No, but like, I mean, if, if, right, if the P black box assumption is itself already in a conditional thing. And now, if, if F is black box, then it's unconditional. The role of P versus NP would be to say 
there's no such thing as a black box on the yeah, okay, okay, okay. Then, then in principle, you could look at the guts inside. Yeah. Now, in fact, P versus NP doesn't imply this. You need something more refined than that. Yeah. But in, this, in the spirit of P versus NP, you could still reasonably conjecture that there's no classical algorithm. One way function, there's something in the uh, This is getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's just conjecture, okay? <laughs> With a black box assumption here. Okay. Now, so let me give it the corollary that you get from this periodicity that if you have an algorithmic finite Abelian group, it'll be finitely generated, and your hiding function could be a, a, an epimorphism to A. And then what this Chorkate of theorem, uh, uh, Chorkate of algorithm does for you, I'm skipping some steps for how you do this, but this is at least believable. Uh, already, just immediately from this epimorphism, it will give you the group structure of A. Okay, so this already is strong enough for factoring integers using the multiplicative group of z minus n. Okay, but with an extended, with an extent, with a refinement for exactly how you use this, you even get the ability to compute the discrete logarithm function. That you not only get this isomorphism between A and a product of cyclic groups, but an algorithm to convert an element of A on the left to to a sequence of residues on the right. Okay. So this is the discrete logarithm problem, generalized discrete logarithm problem for any algorithm that you do. Yeah. What if you take um, P groups instead of the E groups? Well, then it wouldn't have to do with this slide because you got to be. <laughs> because I was a generalized discrete log problem uh, definition by um, Andrew Sutherland in 2000. Yeah, just hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But this already has it has important has applications to algorithmic number theory and and a huge effect on public key cryptography if one of the computers existed. Okay. Fact: all currently standard. Now this has to be said carefully. What I'm not saying on this slide is all cryptography. There was a certain American presidential candidate who got this wrong. Okay. <laughs> Andrew Yang, who got this completely wrong. He said all cryptography, this is wrong. All currently standard public key cryptography rests on the difficulty of this discrete log problem for certain finite view groups A. Okay. So it would all get wiped out with this one short state of algorithm running on a quantum computer if you had the quantum computer. Okay. So now there's this project with Groovy acronyms called post quantum cryptography. Uh, which is a search for uh, other public cryptography methods that are resistant to, to quantum algorithms. So there's even a NIST competition with a bunch of yeah, the, the leaders of funny uh, names. Uh, uh, names. Uh, maybe some of them. <laughs> so this is plenty of motivation. It's not an applied thought. There's group theory reasons, pure mathematics reasons to think about this question, and there's also cryptography reasons to think about this. Now, I personally don't yet know about crypto applications for what it most of what you will discuss. But... I'll be kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay. Uh, so um, now most of the other published literature is on when G is finite. There's an algorithm if G is finite and the H is normal. There's an algorithm if G is finite and almost a view in a certain sense. There's an, there's an algorithm in the two step nil perfect cases. There's a dihedral algorithm in some other cases. Um, so, my thought was to look at what happens when the group is infinite. Excuse me, but for the shortest I think of itself, it was for infinite abelian groups, right? Yeah, nonetheless, most of the infinite, infinite yeah. finitely generated. Okay. In infinitely finite generated. Nonetheless, in response to that paper, most of the later work was in finite groups. It was in, it's in Congress, but that's that's the history of it. Okay. Um, um, so here are a set of my results. Okay. Uh, and I'm only going to talk further about one of them. If you like Greek G be the discrete group of the rational numbers under addition. Then the hidden subgroup problem is NP hard. And for a reason that I will discuss, that's evidence that there's not going to be a good quantum algorithm. Uh, this is the 
this is the one topic of today, if I get to it. If G is free, not none of the in free group with, and you, you should be careful to say how you're encoding elements, but let's say we do word encoding of elements, then the hidden subgroup problem is NP hard, even for normal subgroups. Notwithstanding, in the finite case, that there is a solution already if G is finite and H is all. If G is Z to the K, but with a change in encoding, where you have to write the coordinates in unary, this there's a hardness result there. Okay. And then finally, I did get an extension of short Katea because Z to the, Z to the K with more normal binary encoding, and then then the hidden subgroup has lower rank periodicity or infinite index. But I won't talk about that one today. So now let me, and I can tell there's already a fan, of, another fan of complexity classes. <laughs> okay. So let me just give a little bit of context for that. So what is a, what is a complexity class? Well, it's a set of, of decision or function questions or in the standard jargon, decision or function problems. A decision problem is a function from inputs to yes and no, and a function problem is a function from, from inputs to outputs. And just stuff that can be computed with particular resources. And that, that part's not, rig not really rigorous to part of the definition, but that's what people mean. So here's P, deterministic polynomial time. I mean, as a, 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 Anna was already asking me, so you know, this is the home of, of this is everything that a, a, a normal computer can do without even coin flips. Then BPP is what I already mentioned, randomized polynomial time with with coin flips and with a probably correct answer. Now, NP will be important. And this is decision polynomial time with the aid of a prover who lobbies you with, with a string trying to convince you that the answer is yes. Okay. What does it mean? Okay. Uh, you have an unrealistic computational resource. Uh, a prover wants you to say yes and gives you a string to try to convince you. And you must only check whether the, the proof that you were given is valid, okay? <laughs> so, and if the prover gives up, then, then you, there's an implied answer of no, okay? I'll give you an example in, in a bit, okay? <laughs> in fact, I may be able to skip. So, so NP is asymmetric between, between yes and no. Um, so you can just switch yes and no, and this is called co and P. And then there's BQP, which is quantum polynomial time, and P space is polynomial space with unrestricted time, also an unrealistic resource. You can take, you know, an exponential amount of time, but you're only space limited. Okay. So here's a little diagram of what people believe. Now, whatever NP is, and I promise you I'll give you an example. <laughs> okay. I've, me I've mentioned all of these complexity classes now, and there's a conjecture, the, the standard conjecture is that these two are equal and the others are all different. Okay. Um, and there's reasonable evidence, but, there, but these conjectures are all extremely difficult, okay? And other than that people believe that these two are equal, which is also difficult, uh, it's an open problem, a very difficult open problem, to show that any of them are different, to show that P is even different from P space. Okay. But, you know, conditionally, you just assume this. And actually, you can uh, uh, distinguish all of them if you if you have functions available with a black box assumption. Then, then it's all easy. In fact, it's too easy because if you have a black box uh, attachment to the computer or an oracle, then you can even distinguish P from BPP, even though those two are supposed to be the same. So, So uh, more formally, and I guess my my I guess, I guess I'll go ahead and put uh, the example here. Uh, so what is a problem in NP? Well, it's a decision function g of x, and there is a predicate, which is what the computer you the computer actually does, that depends on x and another bit string y, which is called a certificate. And if the predicate accepts the certificate, then y is a proof that D of X is yes. In other words, the answer to the problem is yes, if, if and only if there is a certificate that satisfies the predicate. So that's the formal definition. 
But down here is a simple example of something that's in NP graph three colorability. If you had an omniscient but biased prover uh, to try to convince you that graphs are three colorable, well, then you can check easily whether the prover is right. The prover should just give you a three coloring. Oh, yeah, what's the three coloring? This is the way to decide the one. Okay. So that's a quick argument that graph three colorability is. Uh, uh, in NP. Okay. But it's not just in NP, it's also NP hard. Uh, there's a theorem, a uh, celebrated result, that, that you can convert any question in NP to a special case of graph three colorability. Okay. So this is so, so that the NP reduces to graph three colorability is that that problem is NP hard. And in NP itself, it makes it NP complete. Okay. So the conjecture that B quantum computers don't contain all of NP is equivalent to the conjecture. This is, by the way, a lot of people talk as if this conjecture is false, that the quantum computers can run, do NP hard things. Well, I'm sorry, people in the field who are knowledgeable conjecture that, that conjecture that you don't have this inclusion. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's saying that NP hard columns are not. In, in, Okay. Uh, now, uh, now I want to get to the to the to the problem. I, I said I would work on the second of the theorems. And what what are the stakes here? This is what this is really about is evidence against the existence of a quantum algorithm for this particular hidden cycle problem. So no, there's not going to be any application to, to cryptography from this. This is just cutting off an avenue for for a crypt, for a quantum attack. Or, Maybe if you even thought of a crypto system where it's relevant. I don't know one, by the way. But let's just take it as a group theory question. Um, you have a function, a hiding function, that hides a normal subgroup N. I've changed it, the name from H to N. And I want to set it up as a decision problem. So we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll, you have to use a bound on, to make it a fair question, we assume a polynomial plane bound on the normal generators of that. I'm saying normal generators rather than generators because n is normal. Okay. Um, then the yes, the decision problem that I want to ask is is n non-trivial? So that's since we assume gener normal generators of n that's other polynomial length, this is immediately an n p itself. If a prover wants you to convince wants to convince you that n isn't trivial, all the prover has to do is, is give you a group, uh, uh, a word in this free group, such that the hiding function takes the same value there and as of the identity finished, okay? Because, because there's the assumption that not only is that periodic, but it's also otherwise objective, okay? <laughs> uh, but it's not just NNP, that's, that's an upper bound of how hard it is. Uh, the interesting theorem is that it's, it's NP hard. It's as hard as anything in NP, so it's an NP complete problem. Okay, so we want to be able to convert other problems in, in NP to special cases of this. Just to better understand your theorem, I think the question also, would you comment on your assumption? So you assume that your normal subgroup has polynomial length normal generators, right? When could you comment on this condition? Not all normal subgroups are like this, or? Well, so how essential is in, in, order, in order to make the question fair at all, it, 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 see if it, you could push the 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 normal generator. I guess that's very long. It's already an obstacle for what you. I mean, it's too much of an obstacle. But I mean, I mean, it's, it's so so. Let me make it. An, let let me say it in more play, plainly. If if you had just the integer z, okay, even for Schwarz algorithm, it would be unfair if the theory disk was too too big. Okay, so what Schwarz algorithm does. There's a, a you have a function that you can compute that's periodic, and the period say has a hundred digits. So it can it can miraculously find these hundred digits for the period. The period is about a Google. So that's a fair question for a quantum computer. But what would be an unfair question is if the period has a Google digits and is about a Google Plex size. Well then 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 it takes all day even to evaluate, even to witness any periodicity whatsoever. 
and I'm sure I'll follow because in, 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 in that feeling you you claim to be a nominal bound, then of course it's unreasonable to, to make uh, uh, let me, let me, you only claim uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, right? So, so here's the point. Polynomial is what? Polynomial in the number of digits of the alpha. <clears throat> so 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 polynomial in the number of digits of, of the answer is matched for a decision problem to the uh, assumption that the answer has a polynomial that you to bound the answer to get a, to get a reasonable decision problem. Yeah. Yeah. So if you strengthen or I guess weaken the assumption from um, polynomial length normal generator, just the fact that there exists a polynomial length generator. So some element of the group is a yeah. polynomial length. Does it still go through or do you need for a well, right? But you see you can just you, you can just replace it by the by only the subgroup that is generated by the generator that you have that are within your horizon to find in the, in the first place. So if, if some of the generators are polynomial size, then you can ignore the other generators and make n smaller, and it won't change the question of whether n is greater. But I'm sorry, I think this will get something very easy. But if you have, I don't know, instead of polynomial, you have something a bit larger, like n to log n or something, is it created? It's not good or what? Well, so NP hardness is is considered the most basic. You know, the, it comes back to the question P versus NP. And NP hardness is just the most basic question. Oh, come on. If you, if you have something like graph free colorability, can't you even show that there's not a polynomial time algorithm? What people really believe is a refinement of this, that it does take exponential time. So and so NP hardness in in the in the post current sense, when you have well, there's, there's a there's an alter, there's a variation of the definition of NP hardness. But if we use NP hardness by this style of definition, so you can just directly translate uh, uh, any question in NP to the target problem with a conversion like this. Well, people are what people really believe is an exponential bound. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, in fact, using a refinement of the P versus NP problem, people would believe that you need exponential time for this. But it, to remind you, already for a classical computer, you're going to need exponential time if that's a black box. So, really, the excitement is, is for quantum algorithms. But still, people believe that, for instance, graph free probability will take exponential time even for a quantum computer. <laughs> okay, so here's the idea. We choose an alphabet A. I mean, I just want to change from, from this integer to an alphabet of that size. And I want to convert the, the set of accepted certificates to a set of normal generators N of the free group. So uh, since N is normal, we obtain a finally presented quotient group with now this funny kind of rule for, the, for, in, for computational group theory. Um, we don't get to see the list of relators directly. There could even be exponentially many of them. And sometimes there are exponentially many solutions. Well, for, for instance, exponentially many three color rings, when, even when there is one. Okay. Instead, if, if the normal generators of N are uh, in some way equivalent to the accepted certificates, you basically have guess and check access to the relators. So you don't you don't get to see the presentation. You you do get to see the alphabet, and after the word, you get to say, "Well, is this a relator? Is that a relator?" And then now you're supposed to do computational group theory with that assumption. Okay. Okay. Um, and then at least we've gotten somewhere because n is it, it's really true that n is trivial if and only if r is empty if and only if uh, the answer is no. So it lines up that. So what does the hiding function do? Well, it factors through this quotient group. So n is otherwise injective, and you can compute it quickly by hypothesis. So what the hiding function really does is it it's some algorithm to provide a canonical name in this target set X, which can be anything, for each coset or for each element in Q given as a word, okay? So what we have set up is the canonical 
main problem for a finitely presented group, except with this strange guess and check hypothesis for access to the real players. Okay. But still, it's, it's a version of the word problem where off, you know, you could say, well, give me a, a canonical word, that's a good special case, but uh, a more general, a little bit more generous version of that is not necessarily a canonical word, but it's just simply a canonical name for any group element. Okay. So the, the goal is to now construct some F with this periodicity, a canonical name solution, which you can efficiently compute using the NP predicate, which amounts to that you can officially compute F with guess and check to access to the relators. Okay. Do we require something from this canonical God? What? Do you require something from the canonical God? You you require that you can you can find it. You can you re, you require that you can compute it easily. But canonical seems is something functorial or what is in what sense canonical? Oh, just it's you're given a word, not a group element of Q. Yeah. And you should you should make a canonical word that tells you which element of Q you have. But given one word in your alphabet, you, you want to, to give another word in the same alphabet word? That, that only depends on the which group element of Q you're in. And that's all no special requirements uh, of it's it's sort of canonical form, but no it, it is form. Kind of, so the only so there are three requirements. Okay, number one, canonical form. Okay, number two, a fast algorithm for canonical form, and number three, only guess and check access to the relators. So that's all. Now those three requirements requirements together are quite a bit, but that is all that we require. But for example, if you take a free group, you can just take an irreducible build or whatever. That would do, except that, that that particular N is not exciting. Then, then, then you would say, well, you know, if you knew for sure then that, 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 that the set R was empty, then that would be a solution. Yeah. Okay. And we don't know what R is, this is the whole problem. Yeah, for example, if any one is a commutator subgroup, you could just take uh, AAA, BBBB. That's right. That, that would be an example of a canonical word. Okay. Now, uh, it is, it is so, so a good candidate is small cancellation theory. So we want to, we, so in general, you know, the, getting a canonical name or a canonical word could be easy or hard or just outright intractable. It's harder than the Halton problem, even. We want it to be easy. Okay. So the idea is choose a small cancellation group. Okay. Which particular C prime one sixth. One sixth. You know, this kind of thing, you Right. Well, so, actually, yeah. any of them will do, but I'm happy with that one. <laughs> okay. But here, yeah, but small consolation, we have some people that are just online, but you can talk on that, but there are many classes right now. If you want one, one six, it's not an I bet you that any of this, any of any, any small cancellation condition that either uh, Linden or Greenlinger ever thought of would be equivalent for this theorem. But I happen to work with C prime one six. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I, I'm just used to that choice. Okay. So the, the the condition is that if you write the relators as cyclic words, then then the intersection between two relators is has at most one is strictly less than six one six length or length of, of the length of either relator. So a binary string certificate Y can be written as a word in two symbols. Okay, A and B. A for zero, B for one. And now I want to convert this to a relator. I don't want to just take it directly to a relator. That's too much. But I will convert it to a relator in F14 by using seven pairs of disjoint symbols. Okay. Um, um, and now, if you think about what these relators do, if you just take any set Y, in particular, if for convenience, I didn't say this, but you might as well take all the y's to be the same length as each other. It's a little bit easier to think about that case. So all, all choices for y have some n bits. And now we have a bunch of relators that have lengths uh, 7n using 14 symbols. And that, that will be c prime 1 6. Okay. 
no, no matter what that is. So I have my corny joke that uh, I don't really have time for. Don't, don't confuse it with the other. It would be cool if I would be both. But actually, that's a distraction in more for more than one reason. Um, the, you can, as you might, you know, F14 and F2 aren't really all that different. It, it doesn't matter. There's a version of this construction to, to, for any FK, uh, uh, as long as K is used to. Okay. So, uh, where does all where does the C prime one six come from? Well, Green and show that if you if you have a non-trivial word for the identity, then you can shorten it by a Okay. And his the style of proof was using Van Kampen diagrams like this. Okay. <laughs> And by a, a, a kind of curvat combinatorial curvature argument, there is one of these relators that, at the periphery that shortens that, that shortens t the, the word for the identity. Um, and when I first got into this, I thought, oh, okay, good. Now am I done? My 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 theorem will work. And then then I realized I learned the hard way. It took me quite a while that just an algorithm to simplify the identity well it solves the word problem, but it doesn't give you canonical names. So that really takes more work. Now the intuition turns out to be correct and mostly not due to me. You actually do get canonical uh, name and canonical words under the exact same hypothesis. So you, you certainly need, need to do more work than what Gurdjieff himself wrote. So what is the difficulty if you do apply this, 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 this gives you a way to simplify only a word for the identity. Uh, so I do for any element. And if you do the same thing for any element, which is not identity, just uh, delete or everything that it's, can it's be. It's not enough. It doesn't give you, it doesn't take you a canonical place. I believe you, but put this trend. Uh, well, so you, so like, you take you, some notes, right? So some notes, just see if there are evidence of, of these pieces of your elements, right? So, so, you, so, so, so the, the inspiration for this was a certain surface for you. Okay, now just take a surface group where the relator is an octagon. And you can have a word of like four that goes halfway around the octagon, and you have two. You have you have you have two choices: clockwise around the octagon, counterclockwise around the octagon. They both have length four. You don't get the condition of a unique answer at the bottom just just by simplifying, just just by shortening the word by induction. You, there are two things at the bottom. So you can make some choice that in the world, if all your latest have all the best, you know, to just to avoid the. This is only the beginning of the extra bad news. And here you have to trust me a little bit, but but this it's just a fact. There can be quite quite a bit of wiggle room at the bottom. And and you're really simply uh simply asking about what's going to come later for what you're supposed to do about this phenomenon that you first see just in a simple case of. Of, uh, the being solved with a surface group. Okay. But essentially, you're correct, but it just requires the extra work to see what to do. And it could recall also the claim of your theorem against the system, except that it is. My theorem? Yes. Um, uh, well, I, you mean as a theorem? Just about small population group, what is exactly the claim? This. Okay. <laughs> okay. But diagram reading Well, you asked me that I had to skip ahead. Ah, so, 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 <laughs> you know, I, 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 no, not yet. There's a few I did it. That's a few slides later. <laughs> so there is something called a thin diagram. Okay. And what really happened, it's a thin one, okay. And what really happens is that you, you, you may prefer geodesic words, okay? Those are the nicest ones. And theorem, all of the geodesic words are organized into a single thin diagram. But maybe already you mentioned some of you know, you, you, you the, the think that the, 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 the conclusion that the way to associate these canonical, uh, canonical words. No, well, that's also true. I, not only is there this, I'll be able to find it. That, that's also true. So, so that's another thing that I proved, but that's not on this slide. That's that's even later. Okay. 
Yeah, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> okay. So we're here, and now I want to just push further. And for a while, uh, Strabel helps. Okay, I just there was this later paper by Strabel, which I thought was extremely nice. Okay, so so just just in general, if V and W are equivalent in in the quotient Q, then they can be connected by what's called an equality diagram. And this is an example of an equality diagram. A, a proof using relators that they're equal. Okay, that they're equivalent. And for starters. You can take equality diagrams that just have a single face, just a single relator, and you can just go by induction and go greedily one relator at a time into what's called Dane reduce. There's, there is not any further a single relator to shorten. So this is something you can do in any group. And even if it's Greenling or C prime one six, you, you don't get a new result for a, a unique result from, from just, just from the Dane reduce condition. There could be many Dane reduced. Forms, but you've gotten somewhere. Okay, so there's a question of what to do that's left. So here, there's this important dilemma of straight. Um, if V and W are both uh, being reduced, then they are connected by a thin equality diagram, meaning each relator intersects both uh, V and W in a string of positive length. Okay, so. This means that to push further from a Dane reduced starting point, which is not unique, you just need thin diagrams. So those are much easier to find. Okay. So the thing that I can show is something that's in that spirit, but it's not the same statement. Uh, wherever the GV6s are, you just have some faith that you can get to them eventually. They all lie in a single thin diagram. And so what the way the way I know this is that if you take any two GUD6, well, they're certainly being reduced because they're GUD6. And the thin diagrams, they just all merge together into one thin diagram. So there's a comment in the chat, which is that this lemma is known for finitely presented small cancellation groups by Stroengel and for infinitely presented small cancellation groups by uh, Golnara, Anson Siva, and uh, Cornelia Drusu um, for graphical small cancellation and Gruber. I would be really happy to have a citation because yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to do to me. I didn't know this, <laughs> but a, a good citation for this would be super helpful. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe I didn't, maybe it was, I didn't know the literature very, very well. But anyway, I slogged through a proof of this. Okay. Okay. So this is not, not, not canonically a, a uh, it looks like an equality diagram, but it's not literally that. As an equality diagram, it's only unique up to candy twists. So in other words, uh, only up to flipping over to the, the, the disk components. Okay. And by the way, using Dijkstra's algorithm, once once you have this, uh, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm in graphs, you can use this to find a, a canonical word too, the short lex word, the, the one that's alphabetically first among the among the Okay. So there's there's this lemma, which I guess can't be due to me, that that in one of these thin diagrams between gain reduced words. Each segment that involves a relator is at least one sixth of the length of the relator. And what does this lemma mean? This uh, imply for us? It means uh, an efficient algorithm to find a thin disk. Because each of these segments it edges is one sixth of the length of whatever relator, the relator is unique from its position. So you don't need to do a branch search to build a thin disk. The only certain thing you have to search over is the position of the disk and the number of faces it has. So that's a polynomial size search. Okay. So you can so from this lemma, which which I'm glad I didn't attribute it to myself, but <laughs> I didn't think it was my own lemma. I thought straight away, I thought I saw it in straight. Away. So what this lemma tells you actually is that actually you can compute these thin, thin diagrams. You can compute them first to get to a GUD signal. And after that, you can, can, can you can further find all of all of these thin disks mm -hmm. that that you need to get the complete duties of the diagram. Okay. And 
this one sixth lemma, one sixth length lemma gives us something better. If these relators have this special form where you basically repeat with different pairs of letters, then see, if you're looking for this relator here, you don't need a complete view of all the list of relators. Just from this edge, that's more than one sixth of the length of this string, it will completely reveal what Y is. So once you know this edge, for instance, you, you can you can learn whether this is related or using guess and check. <laughs> um, so that's then the algorithm. Given a word in F14, we can comp efficiently compute its complete GDC equivalent as a canonical name. Or if you wanted, you, you could compute the uh, 12x word. You can efficiently compute it out. How you can efficiently compute it by searching for all of the things you need to 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 get there okay. and what does that do for you well it's a way to convert any problem into np to the the normal hidden subgroup existence problem for a free group which then says that this problem is np by and that's what i was after <laughs> Are there questions? Maybe we can start in the room. Right. Yeah, Jeff. Do you have any guess for what group for like milk no groups say? Yeah, yeah. No milk groups. Um, what about the diet too? Yeah, sure. If you want a version of Shores here, the Katea part is a bit the um, right sure. Yeah. If you wanted, if you wanted to store the algorithm, well, look, I mean, um, Because the then here, right? You take a finite nilpotent group. Would the yeah. thing be true or okay? Well, here's the if it's finite and two-step nilpotent, that's a published theorem. If it's finite and general nilpotent, well, I think that's not done. But I mean, for infinite, the infinite, infinite. maybe it's clear that yeah, so we have the infinite hydrogen, we have the infinite hydrogen board. Okay. Personally, I'd be optimistic about the Heisenberg group over Z. Okay. You would believe the same thing can be true as for the T, but well, no one would. You're, you're, you're asking me about papers that haven't yet been written. Yeah. But I'll just, I'm happy to conjecture that. <laughs> okay. But look, I mean, uh, one thing I did do was a piece that I discovered, I was kind of shocked actually, it was missing when we find it again. I, until I checked and found out the finite index assumption, I thought that the hidden subgroup problem for Z to the K was completely done. I didn't realize that, for instance, if you have Z squared and a periodicity in only one direction, that there was no published quantum algorithm just even for that case. So I worked pretty hard at this, okay? And that's not even nilpotent yet. <laughs> No potent is going to, no, you know, Heisenberg over Z is going to be even harder than DQ than this theorem for DQ. So, you know, we're, we're working on it. You know, some of us are working on this. But but since two step no potent was done in the finite case, well, that's a reason to be optimistic about two step no potent in the infinite case. However, even in the finite case, they got, they didn't, they got stuck as the nil degree went up. Okay. I don't think they can do nil 20, for instance. I don't know exactly where, where they get stuck, but I, I, I don't think they can do general nil potent groups, even even for, even if it's also finite. Yeah. So I think for finite nilpotent group, because uh, they're also polycyclic in some ways, if it's well, so yeah, it doesn't have an it's, yeah, it's presented. Um, so, um, for, so I think there has been some work done for cyclic by cyclic, and it's cyclic by cyclic. So that could be one way to go through a semi-direct product to answer such questions. Well, some work is the phrase for it because cyclic by cyclic, you know, if, if you have a condition like cyclic by cyclic, that's not very different from two step one point. Or, you know, I mean, I mean, like <laughs> cyclic by cyclic by cyclic, or, you know, like- Well, oh, sure, more, if you have more, enough of them. Yeah, so if, so them. look, I mean, as far as I know, if you, if you stack the nil potent structure enough, then then people get stuck. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. 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 Although the question about the first theorem, 
the G finite H normal? Like, right, what does the complexity assumption, what, what are you actually assuming? How are you given G here, right? For a single finite G, of course, G. Is G so, so two things about this. First of all, this bullet point is a bit simplistic. There's one, there's one step that's not fully known. In order to do short Kitea, you need what's called a quantum Fourier transform circuit or a quantum Fourier transform algorithm. This is actually not known for arbitrary finite G. Okay, so I'm fudging things a little bit, but the way the paper is written is that if you had an algorithm for that and if H is normal, you would be done. And basically, it's the same as the way the Schwartz algorithm works. Um, you you just measure the result of the Fourier transform or the quantum Fourier transform, and this gives you information about the periodicity. Now, for any of these questions, you you have to take seriously something that I I I, I made reference to on this slide. The 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 universe where you're working isn't just a group. It's a group together with the specific encoding of elements. Okay. If you didn't care about the encoding of elements, then something like this would be a non statement. Okay. So the additive Z mod group Z mod P minus one is isomorphic to the, the multiplicative group Z mod P star, but with a very different encoding of elements. Um, nonetheless, the idea is. Uh, for this bullet point, and for all of them, you you have some you you assume an encoding so that the rest of it will work. There, there is an encoding so that the rest of it works. Well, but you're, you're assuming. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but you're assuming some family of for the first year. I'm saying some family of groups, right? As and you as with, with favorable with favorable encoding of the elements. Yeah, but okay. the idea is that if you like in the no potent case, you have polycyclic encoding, sure. So something like that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Or, or if it, if it's solvable in general, you could use you could use a composition series to come up with a good encoding. But, okay, but you but we do look at sort of right, we do have some parameter. The parameter does have to go to infinity, right? So it's the sense, right? And not well, that's true. You, it's really for infinity specific groups. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> All right, are there any questions in the chat? And also, if you're on Zoom, you can also unmute yourself and we should be able to hear you in the room or you can type your question in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> All right, if not, let's thank the speaker again. And we resume in nine minutes. So who who? Uh, Gunara was who is answering you. Gunara, uh, so she answered. Thank you for answering that. But Gunara, and she sent the references that she sent. Could you email that? Yes, I will. I was about to copy and paste them into the email. But yeah.